This is Photographing the West Podcast, the podcast for people who love to explore the western highways and byways while photographing the landscape and wildlife. And now here's your host, Kirby Flanagan. Hello and welcome to the Photographing the West Podcast, brought to you by Flanagan Photos. Twice a month we bring you interviews with interesting people doing interesting things. Most are for photographers, but some are not. Today, I'm talking to professional fine art portrait photographer, Bob Osborne. Welcome to Photographing the West, Bob. Uh, thank you, Kirby. I'm, I'm uh, happy to be on here. And I'm very pleased to uh, have you on. So uh, tell everybody a bit about yourself as a person and a photographer. I'm a photographer, art photographer, as opposed to a uh, documentary. I realize they overlap. Nevertheless, in my mind, I define what I do as art photography. Okay. So you don't do landscapes or, or anything else? You're just doing portraits? Is that? Is that... Uh, I used to do. I did landscapes for a long time. Um, and your uh, question about landscape photography leads into that, if you'd like me to uh, go down that path. Sure. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, I was doing landscapes, large format, you know, this was back in the, what, 80s, 90s, probably seven, yeah, 70s, 80s, 90s, somewhere in there. And one day I'm talking to a lady that I was introduced to, and and it's one of those things where, and, and I'm talking to her and I'm looking at her, she's got these little hippie glasses on, she has a very Scandinavian, Scandinavian uh, Helga appearance uh, she is a middle-aged and a hard-working lady and you could see that i could see that in her eyes it's just right there in front of me and it and it dawned on me to ask her if she'd go along being photographed and the photograph turned out really good what happened was i realized there are people walking around Livingston, Montana, that looked like they came out of Avedon's um, in the American West book. Uh, because of photographing that lady, uh, there are people here that are, they're fat or they're skinny or they're wrinkled or they're smoking or their hair is a mess or just interesting looking people. So what I found was that while the scenics for me did not work in Montana, but there are all these fascinating people walking around. And, and so what I found was I became a art portrait photographer. So did you teach yourself to do portraits or is that something you've done all your life or how did, how did that happen? Uh, right now, after uh, 10 years of doing nothing but portraits, uh, I would answer that question I taught myself. It evolved. I can look back and see each step of the evolution. And now I do it quite well. If ego aside, I'm just trying to answer honestly here. Well, you've uh, taught yourself very well, I would say, looking at your your photos. Thank you. Did you have any role models that you followed or are you just- uh... Oh, absolutely. Let's do, I love this part of it. Uh, Avedon in the American West. One or two things, if he wasn't dead, I'd love to debate with him. Uh, for instance, the white background. Nevertheless, Avedon's in the American West, in my opinion, was a milestone in portrait photography. It changed portrait photography. But prior to that was Irving Penn. Uh, prior to that, Curtis. Uh, prior to that, uh, August Sander. More recent than that, Annie Leibovitz. Her black and white photographs of, I can think of two or three, uh, uh, Willie Nelson, Patti Smith. Uh, just strong, simple, clean, portraits that just speak to you. So I think I just mentioned most of my heroes. Okay. Well, it uh, 
it's quite a collection of heroes. Uh, certainly a lot of uh, good uh, fine art portrait photographers in there. I know one. Let me interrupt you a second. I should. I left out uh, Rembrandt. He absolutely. I I I study Rembrandt. Uh, Caravaggio. I study Caravaggio. I love those guys. Man, do they do? They knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty amazing. So I add those to my heroes. So at what point did you start doing the cowboy portraits? So the subject here is how did I start photographing cowboys? Well, I told you about that lady that I knew a little bit, and I told you about the conditions of that. I was frustrated with scenics, and here's this lady sitting in front of me talking to me that I thought might make a really interesting photograph. It just was there. I have learned to, if I'm looking at something and there's these bells going off in the back of my head, I've learned to try to figure out what the heck, what am I missing here? What is, and so that's, that's where that lady came from. So now uh, I'm going along and what I'm doing is approaching interesting people, some really interesting people, really characters. In Livingston, and a year goes by and I'm photographing them and it's working pretty good. I'm getting some photographs that I think are worthwhile. And one day, just out of the blue, it dawned on me, you know, I should photograph a cowboy. We are, I am in Montana. There are cowboys all around Livingston, all over Montana. And so it, it just dawned on me, I should photograph a cowboy. Well, it took me six months to find one. Uh, to get introduced to him, to approach him and kind of work my way through setting up a photograph. And I took the picture and went back and started working with it. And boy, I'm not sure if I realized this at the time, but I was stuck on cowboys. And from that point, the, the thing is, they are so iconic they the clothes they wear the hat that they wear uh the look in their eyes there's an honesty there's a there's a integrity in the face of every cowboy i've met but but in photographing a lot of montana cowboys i learned where that movie image came from the initial the early photographs of cowboys uh, that I took were so compelling that I did not, I might have photographed one or two other normal people, uh, interesting people in Livingston, but boy, I was hooked on cowboys. It wasn't thought up and planned and determined ahead of time. It was just that, and and then I did do that, and boy, did it it turned it into a uh, I think it was an eight year series of of photographs and traveling to ranches, and and of course it ended in the uh, cowboy book, right? And I published it myself. Well, that happens a lot these days, I guess. So yeah, publishing has totally changed. Totally, totally, totally changed. So are you still doing cowboy portraits or are you? Another guy that I know locally, Chris Douglas, who is a really good photographer. Uh, but but Chris used to, Chris took a, a Photoshop uh, or a workshop from me and he used to stop in the gallery once every month or two, say hello, see what I'm doing, tell me what he's doing. And so one day he came in and, and, and he said, so how's the book going? I said, you know, I think I'm done. And he said, what are you going to do now? And I go, uh, I, it's one of those things where you reach a goal, a major goal in your life, and everything has been focused on that goal, and you get there, and all of a sudden, the heck am I going to do now? And so I told him that, and he laughed, and he said, well, why don't you photograph Indians? And I and I'm I'm thinking about it. And he says, Yeah, I know I I know some Crow Indians pretty well. I could introduce you. And so I said, Okay, cool. Let's let's try that. And I did. 
And so now Indians have entered my life. And that's how that one happened. Uh, to answer your question, no, uh, I don't photograph cowboys anymore because I am so involved with native people that, and I'm heading for actually two more books. Eventually, whether these are through a publisher with hopefully a really good distribution system or whether I publish my, them myself, uh, I don't know, time will tell, but I guarantee you there's gonna be at least one more book and probably two, and it will be on Indians. So uh, as you kind of found out, I guess, uh, it's not easy getting to know cowboys or Indians either one. So how how were you able to gain their trust and uh, and, get, and for them to be willing to, to be photographed? Well, the two are very different. Um, you know, there's a lesson in here. And, and the lesson has to do with, first off, uh, I mentioned it a while ago, a deep awareness, a deep continuing awareness. That's one lesson. Another lesson has to do with your area of comfort. And boy, if you're not willing to step out of your area of comfort, you're probably not going to go anywhere. Uh, cowboys, it went like this. Uh, after I phot photographed that first cowboy, I, I got an introduction to him. Uh, after that, I didn't get any introductions. Uh, I had to find them myself. And so what I would do was if I was in a market and I'd see some guy that looked like a cowboy, I would try to think of something intelligent to say, and I'd walk up and I'd actually, I'd have to do this. I'd have to make my feet walk up there because these are intimidating dudes. I'd have to make my feet walk up there. I can think of one guy. <laughs> Here's a good example. I see this big, burly, bully looking cowboy guy with whiskers and a cigar sticking out of his mouth and a grouchy ass expression on his face. And I'm thinking, oh crap, I gotta walk up and say something to this guy. But I did, and I'm going, okay, feet, walk me up there. I'm trying to think of something intelligent to say, and I'm telling my mouth, okay, open up, something will come out. And, and so something comes out, I guess, it, I guess it was reasonably intelligent, and the guy, sort of stops he was walking when i saw him and i walked up to him and he stops and he turns around and he looks at me and he's giving me this evil eye kind of look and he looks at me for a couple seconds and he goes okay <laughs> and i didn't i had no idea what to say after that but they all kind of went that way they would give me these cowboys would give me this look about what and then they go Okay, sure. <laughs> so here's what happened. Uh, the first year or two, I would I would have to do this, and boy, I guarantee you it's intimidating. But I would do it, and I got to know a few more cowboys, and and by then I had a gallery of my own. And every once in a while, a cowboy'd walk in. Gradually, as another year or two went by, cowboys started stopping in my store to see if I photographed any of their friends or what was going on or what their picture was. Doing. And, and by the end of the time, I was, I was, cowboys would come into my gallery and I'd say, hey, how about, what do you think about being photographed? And they'd go, okay, sure. <laughs> Actually, truthfully, honestly, I think a few of them came in kind of halfway wanting to be photographed. And I have to tell you, a really interesting thing happened in here, not, not through any intelligence of mine. It was just me, this is just me trying to be aware of what's going on. I really, the cowboys here and probably all over the US are dying out. They are, for a whole bunch of reasons. Economics, a bunch of variations of economics. Anyway, they, I think they, I think the cowboys around here, central Montana, realize that they are dying out and that I'm the only guy there who is doing anything 
about preserving their culture. And that wasn't why I'm doing it. I'm an art photographer. I'm an art photographer. I'm trying to photograph the best subjects that I can photograph. I'm not some altruistic somebody or other who's trying to preserve a culture or anything like that. I'm trying to take the, you know what I'm really trying to do? I'm trying to take the best photograph that's ever been taken in the world. Now, having said that, I realize that I probably won't ever get there. Uh, nevertheless, I keep trying. And uh, cowboys make amazing subjects. So anyway, somewhere in the production of this book, towards the end, I think cowboys were starting to realize that whether I was consciously doing this or not, that that I am preserving a culture that is dying out in the United States. And uh, that's kind of how the book turned out. Wasn't my intention, but it did on its own. You develop, my opinion is, when you move into a, a project like this, whether it's photographing cowboys or, or whether it's uh, photographing cowboys in order to produce a book, about cowboys that the project begins taking on a life of its own and it begins kind of telling you how it wants to be done and there's how the photographing cowboys went indians are an entirely different thing because of the history i guess to oversimplify to say between whites you know european migrants to what became America, and and they fo eventually formed into an army. In other words, they wanted the lands that the Indians had, and they were trying to rationalize that it was okay for them to take them. So that history has caused uh, the 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 older and a lot of the younger ones too, but the older traditional Indians to be very distrustful of, for instance, this white photographer who wants to photograph them. And with good reason, I get that. Man, I've studied the history. I'm very familiar now with all of the things that went on and the treaties that were broken and the wars and wounded knee and all of the baloney that happened to get uh, a, a native person to pose and and most of the time i wanted elders because their faces tell so much more of the story a very simple idea for trying to get the best person to photograph that i could and the elders uh just don't trust me at all or, or any other white people. And, and like I said, with good reason. Now, in that sense, what I had to do was fall back on this thing that I'm blessed with, persistence and determination. And, and I did gradually get uh, some native people to pose for me and I got a few really good photographs. And, and I could then take those photographs and if I could get close enough to uh, a, a, a native person who might go along with being photographed, I could show him what I was doing. And, and so that got me a little further down that road. There's, there's a, a quantum leap occurred in that process. Uh, I think it probably comes under the heading of, and I don't know who said this, the harder you work, the luckier you get. A friend of mine came into my gallery one day and he said, you know, I met this guy out in Paradise Valley, which is about a half hour drive from here, uh, who is uh, an Indian and he's working in this quarry out there doing uh, car stone carving. And he might make a good photograph. And the guy that told me this is a good photographer. So 
you know, here's what I'm doing in my head. I'm going, oh no, oh no. I've got to drive out there because the guy doesn't have a phone, doesn't have a car. I have to drive out there and I have to walk up stone cold to this Indian guy. And I know he's not going to trust me. I know he's going to look at me and think of what, what's, the, what's this guy after? On the other hand, my photographer friend, uh, who should know, told me this guy might make a really good photograph. So I did it. I'm back to the deep awareness thing. You know, when something comes up in front of you and the comfort zone thing where, uh, you know what, Kirby, I don't have a comfort zone anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't have a comfort zone anymore. I don't allow myself to do that. I can't get the photographs that I take if I have any semblance of a comfort zone. And so I've just discarded it. I get around it. But anyway, with Don LaRock is the guy's name, Don Rattling Thunder LaRock. One of the pictures that I sent you is the picture that I'm talking about. And it's the one in full war paint where he has, where the Indian has a elk skin wrapped around his shoulders. He has an eagle feather sticking out the back in full war paint. So anyway, I got in the car, drove out to the valley, tried to think of something intelligent to say, made myself walk up to him, and, th and this guy's standing there working on a piece of marble. And I walk up and introduce myself, and I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, this guy would make a really good photograph. And so I, I say something, we talk for a little while, and he says, yeah, okay, I don't mind trying that. Uh, we agreed on a, on a time for a photo session. We had to find traditional clothing for him. That wasn't easy. All of his traditional clothing and regalia was burned in a fire, every bit of it. And so for the photo session, I have to drive all the way out. I have to do it at night, which I'd rather be at home. Uh, I drove out there uh, to pick him up, brought him back into town. We did a photo session, drove him back out there, and I go through the pictures. And they are really good, except he has a mustache. And he in the pictures, he looks like a French trapper. And so now we get into this thing about is the photographer supposed to tell the Indian how he's supposed to look or does the Indian know how he's supposed to look and the photographer should keep his big mouth shut. And so the next time I see Don, I drive out there to show him one of the pictures and very carefully, very politely, I sort of lay the idea on the table that he doesn't really look like an Indian, he looks like a French trapper. And, and so Don goes, oh, well, you want me to shave the mustache off? And so I go, yeah, would you mind? And so now photo session number two comes up. And so I drive back out there and get him and bring him back. And we do photo session number two and we come up with a really, really strong image. In the process of that, in researching, the photograph, I came across a George Catlin painting from the 1830s of an Assiniboine, Don is an Assiniboine, with war paint on. And so in the process of the second photo session, very, very carefully, I sort of, I showed Don a picture that I had got off the internet somewhere. It's just a black and white uh, Xerox image. Of, of this painting with war paint. And, and I show it to Don, he goes, oh, that's a George Catlin painting, isn't it? And I'm, and I'm going, yeah. And he says, so, so what are you thinking? You want me to wear some war paint? And I'm going, yeah, <laughs> if you don't mind. And so the third photo session was with war paint. And that was a really interesting story all by itself. But here's the point of all of this. By the time the third photo session rolled around, Don and I had become friends uh, to the extent that when Don got into town, when somebody gave him a ride, he'd usually stop by the gallery and say, hey, how you doing? And so one day 
I'm explaining to Don how difficult it is to get uh, traditional elder Indians to pose for me because they don't trust me. They don't trust white people in general. And Don says, maybe I, maybe I should uh, go with you. Uh, uh, I had been going up to the Fort Peck Reservation and he was raised in Poplar on the Fort Peck Reservation. And there was a powwow coming up or something like that. And he said, maybe I should go with you. And now here's, here's my brain. I hadn't completely dumped my comfort zone yet. I have now, but at that point, I really hadn't. And I'm thinking, oh man, it's a seven hour drive up there. He smokes, he's a different culture. I'm uncomfortable with this. Um, he doesn't have any money. I'm gonna have to get him a room hauler. And I'm doing all of this stuff why I shouldn't do it. But to my credit, I said, okay, let's do that. <laughs> I can't, I don't even know how to tell you the amazing, amazing things that have come of that. So Don and I drive up there. Boy, do we have some interesting conversations. We drive up there, go to the most primitive powwow I've, I've ever been to in my life. I was the only white guy there, the only white guy there. Uh, and Don introduces me to two or three guys who now, instead of looking at me like, what, what's this white guy trying to pull on me? How's he going to exploit me? Now they're going, okay, we can do that, sure. And, and I got a couple really good pictures from there, but, but can you see, am I making this clear? How, uh, not through any intelligence of my own, but, but through a kind of a persistence and a really deep awareness and a dumping the comfort zone, get that out of your head, how I've gotten to a place where I actually get introduced by an Indian to other traditional Indians who because of the introduction, uh, they do not have these walls up in front of, of them, uh, these exploitation, white, white exploitation walls it is now my my Indian at this point my Indian photography is starting to work a lot better. Okay. Well, uh, you make it sound easy, but I'm sure it wasn't. It ain't easy. <laughs> nope, ain't easy. But I but persistence. Yeah. Well, let's change gears a bit and talk a little bit about uh, the gear you use. Uh, you mentioned uh, large format at one point. Are you still using uh, large format gear or are you switched to DSLRs or what are you doing with that? Uh, DSLR, I use a Nikon and there's a bunch of reasons for this that I find really interesting, but I use the Nikon D4. It's outdated, yes, it works perfect for what I do. And there's a there's one or two reasons for that, uh, but anyway, Nikon D4. I use a uh, the only lens I've used uh, through all the cowboy photography, all of the Indian photography, is a 24 by 120. I think it is a Nikon zoom lens, which all the reports uh, say is a crappy lens. I would contradict that. I would. Uh, Anybody says it's a crappy lens, I would just bring them in and show them one of, you know, when I print these pictures, quite often I will, the pictures that we've been talking about, quite often I will print them up to a, a 36 by 46 inch frame size with a four inch mat all the way around it. Translated, that means a large, a very large enlargement of the image. And so, these people that say, oh, digital is not as good as uh, silver gelatin, or, oh, zoom lenses aren't any good, you need a prime lens, or that says, oh, a D4, 16 megapixels, isn't, you need a D810 at, at 36 megapixels, and I, all I do is I lead them up to one of these pictures and say, okay, tell me what's wrong with this, and that shuts them up. <laughs> well, that... Uh... That takes care of that, I guess, huh? As far as I'm concerned, it does, yes. Okay. 
Well, let's uh, shift gears once again. And uh, you sent me six very wonderful fine art portraits that uh, I think we should discuss. Uh, so let's go through each one, uh, one by one, and you can uh, tell me uh, briefly about uh, the person and uh, the uh, the story of how you came to photograph that person. So the first person that I have uh, on my list is uh, Lee Smoot, I think it's pronounced. That's a good one to start with. <laughs> Lee Smoot. Um, okay, I was in my gallery one day. Uh, a guy comes in and, and boy, I'll tell you what, back then, anybody that came in, I'd, I'd ask them, you know any cowboys around here that might go along being photographed? This was back before they started coming in in um, into my gallery. And okay, so one day a guy comes in, he says, you know who you should photograph, and this guy would make a really good photograph, is Lee Smoot. Somehow or other, Either the guy gave me his phone number or told me how to get it, or I looked it up in the phone book. But somehow or other, I realized that I had driven by Lee Smoot's ranch once or twice. And he lives up this canyon that runs between Big Timber and uh, oh, some little big McLeod. Lee Smoot's ranch. I remembered this because I drive, drove by there. It was a little scary. There are all these big signs out in front of his ranch. They are anti-Semitic signs, conspiracy theory signs, scary stuff. You drive by on the road and you see all these god awful signs out there. I mean, there must be 20 of them. And and just driving by, you, what what you're thinking in your head is, man, I'm I'm going to speed up. If anything, I am not going to slow down at all. So anyway, I made the connection. That's Lee Smoot. And now my brain, we're going back into my brain. My brain's going, oh, you don't want to do this. You do not want to do this. And then I'm thinking what the guy told me about Lee Smoot to make a really good picture. So once again, I'm telling me what to do. Get on the phone, call him up, think of something intelligent to say. And I call Lee up and, and he's, he talks very slowly. And he, and he usually uses one single syllable things. And so I go, uh, hello, is this Lee Smith? He goes, uh, yeah. And I go, uh, my name is Bob Osborne. And, and I go, uh, uh, well, uh, would, would there be any possibility of talking you into being photographed? And he goes, uh, uh, well, okay. And I'm going, once again, I'm almost speechless. I, I haven't thought past that okay thing. And so we agree to meet the next day at uh, around noon. And I said, okay, Lee, uh, I have a white Chevy van. Uh, tomorrow at noon, I will be driving in your gates and don't shoot, okay? <laughs> and he says, oh, okay. <laughs> and so that's how, that's how it was with Lee Smith. And so I went out and met Lee. And like I said, he's a, he, does, he doesn't talk much. Uh, but but we did actually by the t by by the time the whole thing was over with I think we did about four different photo sessions. Uh, the first one I tried to find a backdrop that would go along uh, with with a, a good uh, portrait of him on his ranch. By the way, during this process I didn't realize it, but I was evolving towards the kind of photography that I do now, where everything is a backdrop. Uh, if you want to call it low key lighting, okay, call it whatever you want. But the kind of lighting that I do now, the kind of backdrop that I do now, the kind of, of flash that I do now and fill and stuff like that. But the first one I tried it on his ranch and I didn't get a really good picture. And one of the things about Lee, which you can't tell from the picture that you have, 
but he got kicked in the head really hard by a horse about 20 years ago, and his left eye is just pinched shut. If he's standing there looking at you, you as the person looking at him can't even see his, his eyeball. It's in there, but it's, he's just looking out through a slit. Uh, and his other eye, and he, and he has this kind of Abraham Lincoln look to him. So really good face, really good subject. So the next go around, I got him into uh, uh, my studio. And, and here's what happened. Here's how I got that picture. Uh, I set him down in the studio. He's, he's got the clothes on that you see there. And I tell him, uh, by this time, I knew what my, fo my uh, uh, shutter speed was going to be, what my aperture was going to be, what the setting on the light was going to be. But I always start out a photo session by, by doing this. Uh, Lee, the first oh, five or six or seven photographs don't count. All I'm doing is getting exposure and kind of positioning my light. And and so you can do anything you want. And so I go click, make sure the flash flash fires. Lee, let's see if I can describe this. Lee closes his eyes and lets his head kind of roll back. And and he's there with his eyes closed and his head rolled back. And I'm going, oh, this ain't gonna work. But I shoot it anyway because I want to make sure my lighting is right. And and I shoot. Oh, three or four or five exposures of that. And then I get down to my left brain. Okay, now let's do this. Let's now look this way and look this way and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I get all done. And you know what? The best picture of the whole deal was it was that one up front where I'm going to myself. I'm going, this ain't going to work. <laughs> and that's the picture you're looking at. Yeah. Um made me wonder whether you you had posed this or if this was oh, something he did on his own i would love to claim credit for that let me tell you one more thing about lee smoot uh three four weeks later he came in with a buddy of his and uh, uh i don't know if you grew up in california i don't know if you went through any periods for your uh, in proximity to some really bad people. I mean, mean, ornery, dangerous. Dangerous is a good word, people. But I have. And so if you want to call this imagination, my imagination running wild, or if you want to take my word for it, quite often I can recognize a really dangerous person when they walk up. Okay, so these two dudes walk in, Lee and another old buddy of his. And, you know, there are a lot of stories around Montana about, oh, yeah, that guy just disappeared. And come to find out there's some big squabble going on between some rancher and some jerk. And the jerk just sort of disappears one day. There are not a lot of stories, but there's a few. Lee and his friend walked in. And man, this was a whole different Lee. These guys came in and I'm looking at, at these two old guys. They ain't gonna say much, but they'd shoot my ass if, if I was like stealing one of their cows or something like that. <laughs> so anyway, that's, a, that's the last of the Lee Smoot story. You're using uh, one light as a main light and uh, another light as a fill light. Is that how you're doing these? Yep. I love these guys. You go to a lighting seminar or workshop and the guy will come out and say, okay, you need a key light and a fill light and a hair light and a background light and this light and that light and the other light. And then you can combine them all inside your camera and your camera will know what to do and it will coordinate all this lighting. And oh, man, I use one flash. It's a really powerful flash. So I can shoot at F22 get all the depth of field that I want. I use one flash, I use a fill. I don't do any coordinating inside of my camera. I just set my camera on a 30th of a second so that it won't clip the image. You know, like if I set on a thousandth, I'm gonna get a half of an image. I set it at a 30th of a second, set my camera at a F22 or once in a while F19. If I for some reason, if I'm bouncing the flash off the wall, 
uh, sometimes I don't get quite enough light for an F22. And then I use a fill uh, that I, I bring up real close to the person that I'm photographing. And that gives me the light dark proportions to work with in Photoshop to get the uh, images that you see, the finished images that you see in editing. <laughs> I don't. Okay. Well, let's uh, move along to the next guy, uh, John Hoyland, I guess you'd say. Uh, Okay, one, of, John. one of your favorite subjects, I gather. Yes. Long time ago, probably almost 10 years ago. John is 91 or 92 now. Nine or 10 years ago, when I was asking people to get about cowboys, somebody says, you know, there's an old cowboy that lives up Swingley Road. Don't know where. Don't know his name. Don't know his phone number. But uh, he might make a good picture. Uh, it probably took me a year to track down John. And, and uh, after that, about every six months, I would photograph John again. And he is just one of those wonderful subjects that John should be a museum. He's a, a dinosaur. He's a throwback to the old high Rocky Mountain cowboy ranchers. Uh, when, when John, actually John doesn't drive anymore, all his cars quit. But but when he would drive into town, he would usually drive in in a either a 39 Chevy pickup truck or a uh, what was it a 59 Chevy Bel Air or something that he bought brand new, however many years ago that was. Anyway, that's John, and John just all his wrinkles and the look in his eyes and the beard and the and and anyway, John number 18 is. I think it's the last photograph that I took of John, and I think it's probably the best also. But that's John. I love that guy. He he stops in my he still stops in my gallery uh, once in a while. Come in and and he'll he'll come in and talk to me for about two hours. Kind of a Montana thing. In Montana, if you meet somebody and you say hi, you're in for about an hour of kind of one way conversation. <laughs> And that's John. So so when John comes in and he's talking to me and telling me these stories, I don't I don't even know what decade he's in. What I'm doing in my mind is taking pictures of him. And so quite quite often when he comes in, I'll just drag him back into the studio, <laughs> turn it into a photo session. So that's John. I love that guy. Yeah, I can see why just looking at his photo. So the next one is Don Rattling Thunder LaRoque. Yes, LaRock. LaRock. Uh, actually, I told you I told you Don's story. Right. Uh, so next is uh, Moses Little White Wolf Dion. Yes. Okay, Moses. Uh, Moses, I was introduced to uh, as a traditional. Uh, native guy up there who uh, a lot of of the Indians dance. Uh, I find that I find that really interesting. You can go, yes, you can go to say Crow Fair where there are a million tourists and you think, oh, it's a big tourist thing and they make a lot of money on it. Okay, cool. Uh, on the other hand, I've gone to several uh, uh, powwows in Poplar where there's not a single white person there except me. And what I'm learning is that they dance because it's in their DNA. It's who they are. It's in their culture. That's, that's their, you know, if you call it entertainment or whatever you call it, but the main, the highlights of the year uh, certainly on the Fort Peck Reservation with the uh, Cinnaboan and Sioux tribes uh, is the powwows. Uh, and, and the people who go to the powwows are Indians. A anyway, it's an amazing thing. So Moses dances. And so I was introduced to him and 
And he said, well, why don't you meet me a couple hours before the powwow starts and uh, we'll get to know each other a little bit. And so, so I went over there and met him. He's by his pickup truck and he's getting ready to put his uh, dance regalia on. And boy, I'll tell you what, I spent an, one of the most interesting hours I've ever spent because he explained to, you know, I look at a, uh, let's say the old me before I got to know native people really well. The old me, I would look at uh, an Indian in their dance regalia and I would think, oh, that's a good costume. You don't want to say that, by the way, to Native people. <laughs> These are not costumes. Uh, but, but in my head, I would be thinking, oh, cool, it's fancy and there's feathers sticking out. And there's beads all over the place. Oh, uh, boy. He went through explaining to me every single thing that he put on and every single thing had a meaning, uh, uh, meanings that, that, that related to his children or to visions that he had had or to uh, his given his Indian name of Little White Wolf or just on and on and on every single thing of his dance regalia had meaning, deep meaning. And and so that was the day before I actually got to photograph Moses, but that was just absolutely, that was fascinating. Uh, so we had an arrangement to uh, for the photo session for the next day, actually at an old people's home, uh, not in Poplar where the powwow was, but in Wolf Point, which is about a half hour away from Poplar. And so I met Don over there. I mean, uh, Moses over there. And and we started out with uh, his uh, white wolf pelt on his head and some uh, regalia. And for reasons that I don't recall at this point, it wasn't working real well. And so I mentioned face paint to Moses. And he said, oh, okay, cool. So he put on the face paint that you see, the black up, up across his brow and the two lightning bolts coming down. And, and, he, and he went into the bathroom to do that where there's a mirror. And then he came back out and he had the face paint on. And because the uh, wolf pelt wasn't as work, I thought it would work really well. Uh, like a picture of Curtis's where there's this guy that has a bear skin rug on and the bear's head is right over his head. Uh, but it didn't work. And so I was sort of led, the photo session kind of led me to get rid of the pelt, uh, to get rid of the, originally I was thinking of uh, uh, Sundance scars because Moses is a sun dancer and he has the scars where, where his uh, pecs were pierced. Uh, and I was thinking of uh, uh, Sundance scars. And so I asked him if he would mind taking his shirt off. Uh, and he didn't mind, and and so we did it, and and there's where that picture came from. But now let me go back. Uh, we would we would shoot a little bit, and then Moses would talk to me a little bit, and then we would shoot a little bit, and Moses would talk to me a little bit. Two things happened by the time that photo session was over with. One is, was, is that I am convinced that Moses is some kind of a spiritual man within his tribe. Uh, a healer, I think he's a healer personally, but something mystical, something spiritual. The other thing that happened was we got done with the photo session and so I'm breaking down. Moses is helping me carry things out to the truck. And I was thinking about it. And I was thinking, oh, that was probably an hour, hour and a half. Uh, we got done and we're out there talking. And, and, and for some reason, I clicked my phone on and looked at the time. That photo session lasted five hours. Five hours. And it went by like it like it was about a one hour photo session. So that's Moses. And then we've got two more. Uh, one is uh, Melanie. Melanie. 
Mm-hmm. And she's okay. uh, homeless, I think you said. Yes. Uh, Melanie is uh, uh, lives in Poplar. She, Poplar. She's a street person. Poplar, as in the tree. Poplar. Uh, she's a, a street person, homeless, meth addict. She is uh, in her 20s, probably 26, 27. Uh, she could be a gorgeous young lady, except she's a meth addict and and her brain is affected by that and and so she is homeless and mentally impaired and that's she Melanie. looks about 10 years older than uh, mid-20s yes. yes and she'll probably be dead by the time she bit probably before she gets very far into her 30s and you've captured all that very well it's uh the lighting on her face and her hands is just awesome. Discussing Melanie, I think her eyes, her hand, her posture, the position of her head does tell that story. And in the process of doing that picture, I try to get everything I can in that print to also support the story. And and that has to do with the darkness of the print and the darkness of being a street person and just darkness, despair, darkness. So that's Melanie. Yeah. Sad story. Yes. Okay, one more. Uh, this is Sonia. Sonia. Uh, Sonia is, I believe she's a Wolf Point. Uh, street person, pretty sure. Does it say? Does the caption say Wolf Point? Yes. Okay, it's still on the Fort Peck Reservation. Okay, Sonia. A couple things that Sonia told me, who will kind of explain who she is. First off, yes, uh, she's. Uh, I believe she's uh, Sue Lakota Sue if I remember correctly, uh, uh, a native person. Notice that the traditional people, the traditional pictures that we discussed a few minutes ago and the street people, they're all native people, all on the reservation, and yet they are diametrically opposed. And that is part of the chaos that exists on to, to one degree or another, probably on uh, Indian reservations across America. But back to the uh, Wolf Point street person, Sonia, who if you look carefully at the pictures, I, when I'm editing these pictures, I look at, I go, I am, I know every inch of their faces. And there are so many scars. Sonia has a, a burn scar on her wrist. She's got scars on her face, little scars where I know she's been beat up or punched or cut or or something or other, probably raped. So here's what Sonia, I talk to these people when I photograph them. And, and I ask them permission to do this ahead of time. While I'm photographing uh, street people, I, I ask them for permission to uh, ask them questions, very penetrating questions. And let's see, one of the questions that I asked uh, Sonia was, uh, what, what are you addicted to? Because they're all addicted. Uh, they're, they're alcoholics or meth addicts, or some of them are on uh, morphine or drugs that you can't even imagine. But most of them are alcoholics. Most people on the reservation are alcoholics, part of the chaos. Sonia said, I will take anything, I will drink anything, I whatever I can get a hold of. Uh, another thing that I asked her was, so when it's 40 degrees below zero here, which she gets down there up on the reservation there, where do you sleep? And she says, I, I sleep anywhere I can, anywhere. 
And another question I remember asking her was, what is what is the hard, hardest part about being on the streets? And she thought about that for a while and she said, everything. So that's Sonia. Wow. Well, it's uh, time to break this up, I guess. I hate to do that. It's been uh, great talking to you and uh, listening to your stories. But we should uh, talk for a minute about where people can find you and your pho photographs and your books. Oh, yeah, well, that's pretty easy. Uh, the book uh, is on Amazon. Uh, my gallery is in Livingston on Main Street. And my photographs are there. And uh, I'm in a few galleries around, but the pictures that we're discussing today, I'm in two ga uh, my gallery and one other gallery in Montana, which is the uh, Creighton Block Gallery up in uh, uh, Big Sky. Livingston, best places, Main Street, Livingston, the Robert Osborne Gallery. Uh, my website is uh, obviously robertosborne.com or something like that will get you there. That's it. That's all the promo stuff. Okay. Well, it really has been great. Uh, thank you for taking the time and uh, effort to be on the show. A little bit of my outro. Uh, each episode of Photographing the West is published on the 15th and 30th of the month on www.photographingthewest.net, uh, one of my websites, as well as on wow. I iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and a bunch of other places. So thanks for listening. Bye for now. Uh, talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Kirby. I appreciate you inviting me to do this. I appreciate you doing it. You're, You're a good very, guy. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to Photographing the West podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and leave us a review. Till next time, here's wishing you safe travels and good light. <laughs>